Okay, welcome everyone. Uh, thank you for tuning in uh, this evening. Uh, my name is Dalton Hesley. I am program manager of Rescue Reef and a senior research associate at the University of Miami's Rosenstiel School. Uh, so tonight is actually the second part of our Coral Conversations uh, series. Uh, but if you didn't tune into the first one, uh, that is completely okay. It was mostly an overview of our research, our uh, coral restoration program, uh, and Rescue Reef. Um, so tonight we're really excited to actually take a deeper dive into our research. You know, a lot of the behind the scenes things that isn't visible to the Rescue Reef community is still really, really exciting and important for the field of reef restoration and conservation. And so tonight we're excited to have three of our research associates speaking more in depth on what they did during their time uh, with our team, whether past or present, uh, as well as that what that means for the greater field of coral reef restoration. Um, so thank you again for tuning in. Uh, a few small notes is we are accepting Q and A's. So you will see at the bottom of your screen, there's a box labeled Q and A. So at any time throughout the, the talk tonight, you are welcome to type in your question uh, and we will either address it sometime during the presentation uh, via message or live at the end. Um, so. Either way, you're welcome to type it in uh, and we'll make sure to try and get to that. Um, additionally, we're gonna have a few polls. Uh, so we're going to try and figure out, you know, where you're coming from, um, maybe what your interests are uh, to make sure it's a little interactive because we want this to be uh, as much a learning experience for you. Um, so first, uh, where are you all tuning in from? All right, awesome. Looks like we have some diversity, people tuning in from all over the place, so welcome everyone near and far. All right, we'll move on to the next question. So here we're just interested to see if you actually did get an opportunity to tune into our last one. If you did not get a chance to tune into our last webinar, again, that's completely fine. You, you're not, uh, it wasn't required for this one, uh, but it is online. So you're able to go to our Facebook page and uh, watch the first one uh, where we had other guest speakers. Okay, looks fairly split. Looks like about 15 and, and 10. So we'll have some people familiar and some that are, are new. Um, so I believe we just have one more question for everyone. So we're just interested in how you heard about this. Uh, we have a lot of followers online. Uh, we have an email list, um, but we're always interested in learning how to connect with new audiences. All right, great. Sounds like we're connecting with people in tons of different ways. That's good to hear. Okay, now that we know a little bit about all of you, uh, I'd like to tell you a little bit about us. Um, so we have three panelists tonight. Uh, like I mentioned, they're all either past or present uh, research associates in our lab, uh, each with their own specialty. So it's kind of a cool presentation night. First, we have Joe Unsworth, who is a current research associate in our lab, uh, whose specialty thus far has been on how to scale up coral reef restoration so that we can do as much as possible underwater. Uh, and really great in our impact. Next, we have Maddie Kaufman, another current research associate uh, whose specialty has been in coral resilience. So she's going to speak on how best to increase uh, the type of restoration we're doing and really prepare these corals for the future. And last but not least is Jane Carrick, who was a research associate of ours, but has now moved on to her PhD. Uh, we were incredibly sad to see her go, uh, but we're excited to see what she's going to do next uh, with a focus on deep water corals. Um, but her talk tonight will be on coastal resilience. So we understand uh, the issues corals are facing and what we're doing to restore them. Um, but she's gonna cover the why, you know, what, what value are coral reefs really bringing to us? Um, so without further ado, I'm going to pass it over to Joe uh, to start off our talk for the night. All right, thank you, Dalton. Um, my name is Joe Unsworth, as Dalton just said. Um, and I've been working a lot in finding new methods and new techniques that is gonna help us scale up um, what we're doing. Um, so hopefully if you found your way into this webinar, you're uh, deeply aware of what corals are. Um, but just to reiterate, these are uh, small colonial animals that come together to form some of the largest uh, geographic formations on our planet. Um, and it's actually what the bedrock of Florida is made out of is limestone from ancient coral reefs. Um, so Florida is deeply intertwined with the coral animal. 
Unfortunately, if you're, if you're tuning in, you're also probably aware of the decline that these coral reefs are facing um, throughout the world. Um, and as a result of this, there are a lot of ways that humans are trying to kind of intervene in this decline. Um, this, this map shows all the different locations where, um, where these interventions are happening. Um, one of the key interventions that we've uh, taken a significant interest in is called coral gardening. And just to give you the bird's eye view of this, this is where we collect um, colonies, natural colonies from the reef. We grow them out in our offshore coral nurseries. This is an example of one of those structures. You can see the corals are hanging there. Um, they grow a lot faster when they're hanging uh, in the middle of the water column. And then we cut down fragments of coral and we outplant them back onto reefs where their population will eventually grow and hopefully be restored to what it once was. Um, and finally, we monitor everything that we outplant. We wanna see how it's doing, is it surviving or, or dying? Um, all of those different metrics help us uh, kind of evaluate our own success, which is very important as a uh, organization. And one of the problems that we've kind of been facing, um, as well as many other organizations throughout the world, is that we're growing a lot of coral. These are all, the, all different uh, nurseries examples. Um, you can see that we've gotten really great at scaling up our nursery operations. All of the nursery structures are pretty cheap to build and relatively easy to maintain, and they grow a lot of coral. Um, unfortunately, that's not really being met when it comes to outplanting these colonies back onto a reef. Um, so the two current uh, methods that most uh, organizations in Florida use um, are the nail and cable tie method. This is where a, a stainless steel masonry nail is hammered directly into the reef. Um, and then a coral fragment is zip tied using plastic zip, tie, zip ties um, directly onto the masonry nail. And the coral eventually grows over everything and it's all good, um, but this takes a long time. Um, and the same is true for this uh, two-part epoxy putty, um, which is pretty popular as well. Um, essentially, you mold it like Play-Doh into the reef, um, and then you can kind of glue the corals on individually. Um, but really what it comes down to is that one diver can only outplant so many corals per dive per day. Um, so that's kind of the limiting reagent that we're coming up against right now. Um, and that's kind of the basis for my work, um, is seeing how we can develop a more cost and time efficient coral attachment technique that still maintains high survivorship. And I wanted to do this using a really broadly, uh, widely available um, building material, cement. Um, so this is a material that's used in buildings all over the world. Um, there are so many different variations and it's already being used for restoration in some parts of the world. Um, so I wanted to see how we could kind of use this new attachment technique to scale up our operations to be more efficient. So I started by asking a bunch of experts, getting their advice on what kind of ingredients to use um, while I was testing these different techniques. Um, and I came up with a list of 45 different cement mixes. These, are, um, these contain different uh, types of sands, um, micro silica, um, all kinds of different clays and, and uh, several different ingredients that ultimately come together to form a laundry list of candidate mixes that we went through with these trials. And these trials included, um, I'm not gonna go super in depth into them, um, but they came down to first, we tested out the consistency of each mix. We mixed it with water and put it on in, in a seawater tank to see how it behaved. Um, did it eventually slump out into the, like a, a loose pile or did it hold together and was it able to hold corals upright? Um, that's what we tested next, was we used uh, dead coral fragments to kind of simulate a real life outplanting situation to see if the cement would be strong enough to hold these corals upright throughout the duration of their lives. And then finally, we included uh, some of the restoration mixes that are already being used to plant corals at, in other parts of the world. So some of these locations are from uh, another place in Florida, we have a mix from the Seychelles, Belize, as well as Puerto Rico. And we included those in a final kind of big outplanting trial where we tested, we outplanted corals with several different cement mixes um, to see if any of the, the, the specific cement mixes had a significant impact on survivorship or um, 
or attachment success. So the final one that we came up with, um, for anyone who knows uh, cement, it's a part, one part Portland cement, which is the most commonly used type of cement to a tenth of a part microsilica. And this is an additive that uh, is commonly used in uh, cement uh, structures that are in contact with seawater. Um, basically how we use it, we mix it in the field um, and then we contain it in these plastic icing bags like you would use to ice a cake. Um, and then we deploy those underwater into these kind of cement bases. And then you can just add the corals in. Um, and it works really well. Um, and it yields, we found, equal survivorship and attachment success to the two other methods, um, which is pretty key. We don't want to be taking a step backwards. We want to continue moving forward. Um, we want to make sure that any new attachment methods we have lead to the same high survivorship that the other methods also had. So this is kind of an example. This shows a basically a before and after. Um, the before photo, you can see the, the new cement base um, with the brand new coral fragments just sitting in there. Um, and you can see that after only seven months, um, all of the fragments have completely almost covered over the cement base. They kind of encrust from their bases um, to really kind of anchor themselves onto the substrate. And that's a pretty key thing that we found. This is another example of that. You can see a kind of more macro view of that, of the coral kind of skirting and crusting its tissue over the cement base. Um, and this was pretty, pretty promising results for us. We were pretty happy with this. But the thing that we were pretty most happy with, I think, um, was when we compare the cost uh, in terms of materials for each of these attachment methods. So we can see the nail and cable tie method, pretty good, 50 cents per coral roughly. Epoxy is a little bit more, 60 cents, but the cement was only a nickel. It came down to about five cents per coral planted. Um, and when you're scale talking about outplanting tens of thousands of corals, um, scaling up to that level um, and beyond that level, then this is gonna make a huge difference uh, for our lab moving forward. Um, in addition to this, we also found that uh, we're much more efficient um, outplanting with the cement because we don't have to waste time hammering in nails and fl fiddling with zip ties, that kind of thing. We can just dollop out cement and just move like a conveyor belt over the reef. Um, so we were pretty happy with this. Um, up until now, I've exclusively been talking about staghorn coral, which is the, uh, the species that most restoration organizations in the Caribbean kind of focus on. Um, it's a great species for that because it's so easy to cut it apart. Um, it's really easy to, it grows really fast. All of that kind of, all of that stuff is great, but it kind of leaves out this really important part of the coral ecosystem, which is the massive corals. This is an example of one of those corals. Here, massive refers to the kind of growth mortho morphology, um, that kind of boulder structure rather than branching. Um, other examples of this include boulder, uh, boulder and star coral. Um, so we've recently been uh, uh, working on our uh, propagation techniques for this new massive coral. And thankfully, we're not the only ones. Um, so scientists from Moat, um, a couple years back came up with this new technique called microfragmentation, where essentially the way that you fragment the coral enables, uh, enables the coral to grow at almost five times the usual rate. So it really kind of accelerates their growth, um, which is great for us because it means that we can kind of scale up our operation in the same way. Um, the problem with this is we tried outplanting a bunch of these and they didn't do too hot. So we saw about 50% mortality within only six months after outplanting, which is not uh, by any means ideal. Um, and the main kind of culprit we found behind this was parrotfish, specifically the spotlight, uh, stoplight parrotfish, um, which you can see there. Um, this is a, a pretty common grazer, especially on Florida reefs. Um, and we really weren't sure why they were going after specifically these small kind of new outplant um, massive corals. Um, they're pretty, pretty much known to be eating algae, um, and occasionally they'll scrape on some, some uh, larger corals, but they really um, focused on our outplants. Um, so we wanted to figure out how we could possibly, uh, if we're going to be scaling up um, massive coral outplanting, how can we mitigate this predation effect? Um, and this is where I'm going to transition into work. Um, all of this following work was done by Nico Rivas. Um, who is also a, a master student at the same time as me. 
Um, and he is uh, unable to join us tonight, but I figured I would take um, on the mantle of presenting some of his research um, so that we could get it out to the public. So he tried a couple of different things to kind of deter these, these parrotfish predators um, from eating our corals. So these are uh, three of the treatments that he tried. We have uh, two kinds of cages, one that has an open top and one that has a closed top. Um, and these were kind of to stop the, directly uh, prevent the fish from getting at the coral. The coral would go kind of in that little um, area inside the cage. He also outplanted corals with uh, spikes. You can see down in the bottom left there, um, some examples of that. They have these kind of uh, metal spikes that are sticking out that are gonna prevent any fish from getting in there. Um, and then we also compared these to unprotected kind of naked uh, control corals that were just sitting out on the reef to give us kind of a baseline uh, measurement for predation. And this is what he found. Um, we can see that uh, the, uh, the cages did relatively well. Um, of it, the, the protection uh, uh, deterrents were removed after only four weeks. Um, so you can see the kind of mortality that we're dealing with after that time. Um, even after the corals had had some time to kind of settle and, and heal um, from being outplanted, um, we're still seeing pretty high mortality. Um, but what we took away from this was that spikes are ultimately seem to be the most effective. Um, and they showed the lowest mortality overall. Um, and we kind of took this and ran. Uh, we said, hey, we have all of these um, staghorn outplants, these successful restoration plots that are seeing very low um, predation um, naturally. We thought these are kind of like spikes. Let's see if we can use the existing Acropora colonies, the staghorn, as a protection device for the massive coral outplants. Um, and so the way he set this up was pretty cool. Um, he set up three, uh, three massive outplants per staghorn colony at varying distances from each, uh, each branching coral. So you can see that this is the closest one. It's pretty much covered by the, the staghorn. And then we have another one that's 25 centimeters away and then another one that's further away. Um, and so this is how we set it up. Um, and he kind of eventually measured all of the uh, mortality that was seen on each of these corals progressing further and further away from the staghorn. And this is what he found. Um, essentially the corals that were right underneath the, the staghorn colony did the best. So you can see those are in the, the, the navy blue in that figure. Um, they showed the lowest probability of mortality, while the, the corals that were further away showed the highest probability of mortality, um, almost 90% after four weeks. So you can see this is pretty promising, um, and it kind of makes the argument that we should be um, outplanting these colonies in very high, high diversity arrays. So outplanting staghorn colonies in combination with massive uh, coral outplants can really kind of mitigate that predation effects that we've been seeing um, on our corals. Um, and that's where I'm going to kind of leave you guys for today. I'm gonna to pass it over to Maddie Kaufman uh, so she can talk about what she's been up to. All right, thank you for handing it over, Joe. Great talk. I'm gonna start my slides. Um, yeah, so Joe just kind of covered how we can really scale up restoration and I'm gonna talk about how we can use resiliency research to make sure that this, these scaled up restoration plots have the highest likelihood of success under future climate conditions and other potential future stressors. But first, I just wanted to give a quick background of how I got involved in all of this. Um, since this is a rescue reef talk, I actually went on my first rescue reef trip back in 2016, uh, loved it so much and went on four additional trips after that and actually ended up um, blogging for them unsolicited on my own. because I was like, I want to do more. I'm going to find some ways to get involved and um, ended up working as staff and then as a master's student. And if any of you guys have heard Dalton talk, uh, you know that the main goal of citizen science is getting the community involved and in, um, instilling that environmental stewardship. So Rescue Reef, uh, you're really getting that job done. But anyways, um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about ecological resilience. So to start, I wanted to give you guys a definition of uh, this term, which is the capacity of an ecosystem to respond to a disturbance by either resisting damage or recovering quickly. 
So when we're thinking about coral reef plots, um, it's their ability to either resist or recover from stress events like bleaching events and um, hurricane events. And so there are a variety of ways to increase resilience. This is just kind of a bare bones list. And if this interests you, there's some really, really amazing research going on. So I encourage you to dive deeper uh, into this after this talk. Um, the three listed on the left are all about diversity. Um, as some of you guys might know, increasing diversity is essential for resilience. The more diverse the population, the greater likelihood that there will be individuals on the reef that can either resist or recover from these events. So you can do this on the species level, the way that um, Joe was just talking about, but you can also do this on the genotype level. So if you're working with one species like staghorn, uh, you want to restore with as many uh, genotypes as possible. And you can also increase diversity by uh, working with sexual reproduction. So rather than working with the corals that are already on the reef, that standing variation, by um, kind of doing sexual reproduction restoration, you end up with new combinations of alleles, new genotypes, and exponentially increasing that diversity on the reef. Um, and then moving on, you can also uh, do stress hardening. That's something that the Baker Lab at the University of Miami is um, really working on. So that's when you expose corals to a stressor so that the next time they face it, there's a higher likelihood that they're able to uh, resist or recover from it uh, down the line. And there's also assisted migration. So that's kind of working with nature's stress hardening. So for example, working with corals that are from lower latitudes, from warmer environments that have been exposed to these warmer environments in the past. If we move them to cooler reefs where they're expected to warm due to the projected uh, impacts of climate change, they can um, introduce warm adapted alleles to those environments. And then finally, you can exploit resilient phenotypes. So what I mean by that, where phenotype is kind of a trait or a uh, behavior like growth, like thermal tolerance, if we can identify corals that inherently have these particular rapid growth rates or particular disease resistance. Uh, we'll want to selectively propagate those within our nurseries and also selectively outplant them to our restoration plots. So I'm gonna focus for the rest of these slides, focus on uh, my particular research looking into assisted migration and um, exploiting resilient phenotypes. And just for a quick background with this differential performance, the uh, varying behaviors of our coral individuals, there's been a lot of research in this within our uh, particular staghorn corals that we focus on at Rescue Reef and at the Learman Lab. There have been studies that found certain genotypes are thermally tolerant, certain genotypes are more rapid growers, certain genotypes calcify better, and certain genotypes are um, more disease resistant than others. And with assisted migration, this kind of depends upon the fact that uh, there are particular coral species that have this uh, inherent thermal tolerance. And so when I was uh, deciding kind of what I wanted to focus on for my master's research, again, uh, thermal tolerance is of uh, crucial importance right now with the looming threats of climate change. Uh, but then I also focused in on lesion recovery or wound healing. And uh, this is because there's really uh, a huge scarcity of research about wound healing in staghorn coral, which I've always said is very ironic because we wound them throughout every step of the restoration process. So we collect, when we propagate, when we outplant. And on top of that, they're wounded all the time in the natural environment. They're branching corals, so they're really prone, uh, prone to fragmentation. And so when we have storm events or when animals run into the reef, they're fragmented a whole lot naturally. And their ability to recover is really important for survivorship because the more quickly they can heal the wounds, the more quickly they protect themselves from disease-causing pathogens in the water column, and from other colonizing organisms and algae. So I was interested in this and then also seeing kind of how uh, thermal history plays a role in a coral's ability to uh, recover under heat stress. 
And so this map on the left shows just a few of the reefs that we have genotypes from. We have a couple of more, but uh, the ones involved in this particular study I'm about to describe are pictured here. And we're really fortunate because we have a whole range of environments where these genotypes have been collected from. And that means they've evolved in kind of unique conditions and they've likely evolved certain adaptive traits unique to their uh, source environment. And also, as you can see on the right, this shows the sea surface temperatures of, the, um, of this area. And there's a whole range of thermal environments that these corals have been collected from. And so as you can see with this little squiggly arrow that's kind of visualizing what we want with assisted migration, we're interested in moving these corals from these hotter reefs in the yellow and the red to uh, northern regions like Broward and Sunny Isles, where um, if this all holds true and thermal tolerance um, is sourced from these southern reefs, um, there's great interest in doing that. So for the particular study I'm going to describe, I ended up working with about 18 genotypes and I had two treatments. One which was an ambient treatment. The corals uh, were left at ambient temperatures throughout the entire experiment. And then the heat treatment, I ended up ramping them to about 31 degrees Celsius and then holding them at that high temperature for the rest of the experiment. So we had a couple replicate fragments per genotype within these treatments. And at the start of the experiment, we ended up wounding them simply by uh, snipping off a branch. And we just tracked that wound um, as it healed or did not heal over the course of the experiment. And we did find evidence that these coral genotypes perform differently when it comes to wound healing. Uh, this figure here shows the different genotypes. Each bar represents the average days until healing under that ambient treatment. This doesn't show the heat treatment because a lot of corals didn't heal and so I don't have days until healing values for them. And, but again, as you can see to the left, we have some genotypes that only took about 10 days to heal, whereas on the other end of the spectrum, uh, certain genotypes took about double that amount of time. But then more excitingly, uh, found this awesome evidence for heat adaptation. So this figure here shows the outcomes of a Cox proportional hazards model. Don't worry, you don't need to know all about what that entails. But um, the long and short of it is on the y-axis. That's the cumulative hazard for hazard being healing. So it's basically the likelihood that these corals healed throughout the days of the experiment on the x-axis. And the solid lines show the uh, colonies that were not exposed to heat stress whereas the dashed lines show the colonies that were in that temperature ramp. And then the lines are color coded by red if these um, corals were from a warmer donor reef, so southern, uh, been exposed or evolved in warmer conditions, and blue indicates being from a cooler reef. And so if you focus in on the dashed lines, those are under heat stress, you can clearly see that that likelihood of healing is much greater, higher on that y-axis compared to corals from cooler donor reefs. And then it's also important that when you look at the ambient uh, treatment corals that there's no effect of uh, donor reef history, which again is important because say that the corals from warmer environments didn't do as well under ambient conditions and we couldn't really um, totally support assisted migration because during the year, uh, time of the year when it's not stressful, those um, corals from warmer environments um, might end up being maladapted, but we don't have to worry about that according to these outcomes. So then finally, the applications of this research is really exciting. Um, you can selectively propagate corals that are rapid wound healers, because that's a really important trait, and uh, strategic outplanting. So if there are certain sites that are more prone to fragmentation, for example, um, an area of higher wave energy or higher likelihood of being wounded, We'll definitely want to strategically outplant the rapid healers there. And like I described, um, we found some evidence for assisted migration. But as with everything, there are considerations to take into consideration. Um, one being trade offs. So a lot of coral performances have been um, identified to have trade offs. So, for example, a coral that is a rapid or that is thermal tolerant 
has been shown to grow more slowly. So that's just one example, but something to really keep in mind because if we're selectively propagating for a particular phenotype, we really need to know what we might be selecting against because it might be something important. And um, on another note, there's also a lot of uncertainty in what the environments will be like in the future. And we're not really sure if the outcomes of the uh, research settings that we're using in these particular cases are representative of that. And uh, that's kind of a form of plasticity, which by definition is when your performance varies based on uh, your location or the environmental influences. And so it's really important when you're doing these uh, performance assays to do them in multiple environments so that you know that the winners are the ones that are really rapid healers in my case. Uh, make sure that holds true in multiple reef settings uh, throughout the reef tract. So with that, uh, that is everything. If you guys have questions, feel free to put them in the chat. Um, my email's here, but now I'll hand it over to Jane to talk about why this is so important for our coastal communities and everyone. Hi there, everyone. Um, I am Jane. Uh, hopefully everyone can see my screen and um, hear me. So um, I'm going to be talking about some of the work that um, we've been doing looking at how coral restoration um, can be um, applied to coastal protection. So um, I'm actually a former research associate, former as of um, Tuesday, I believe. I just started a PhD up here in New England, but um, all the work that I've done at University of Miami um, has been pretty closely related to this project. And this project was funded by um, a program called ULINK, which is a um, which is a internal grant source through University of Miami, and it brings together teams of interdisciplinary researchers. And this project was very interdisciplinary. We had uh, scientists from the engineering department, from um, ocean sciences, as well as uh, several other, um, and of, of course us in marine ecology. Um, we're kind of we're focusing in on how we can apply coral restoration techniques for the purpose of coastal protection. All right, so I wanna frame this by first talking a little bit about um, the ecosystem services that we get from reefs. Um, despite occupying a very small area of the ocean floor, they actually provide um, significant ecosystem services. And if you're not familiar with that term, an ecosystem service is basically a benefit to humans um, that comes directly from the ecosystem. Um, so again, despite occupying that really small amount of space on the ocean floor, um, reefs actually support about 25% of the um, of, of uh, marine organisms. So a quarter of all marine organisms have some life stage um, in, in and on the reef, whether that's hiding from predators or um, being used as nursery or spawning grounds. Basically, marine biodiversity is massively supported by reefs. Um, and that kind of feeds into fisheries and food sources as well. So whether um, if we're talking about like a large industrial commercial fishery um, or a small scale artisanal fishery from a, a small village, um, the food and the income that is provided through fisheries from reefs is massive. Um, in the US alone, actually, reef-based fisheries equate to about $100 million per year, which is massive. Um, they also support the uh, economies for the tourism and recreation industry, for divers and snorkelers and, um, and fishing charters, that's a huge one. Uh, I believe that contributes about $9.6 billion to the global economy overall. Um, and also a less well-known one is medicines. So um, some of the, um, some of the uh, compounds that can be found on reefs come, uh, are, are being used in medical research to look at um, things like anti-inflammatory properties, anti-cancer um, medicines, and antibacterial medicines as well. And then lastly, of course, we'll begin, oops, excuse me. Uh, we're gonna be talking about coastal protection pretty much at length um, in this talk. So coastal protection is one of the major ecosystem services provided by reefs. And um, when we're talking about coral restoration, we basically wanna make sure that we are, we're not just talking about restoring coral, right? We're talking about trying to bring back the services that they provide as well. Um, and so that is really the main focus of this talk. So what are we talking about when we're talking about coastal protection? Our coastlines are very much at risk these days. We have about 40% of the global population living within 100 kilometers of the shoreline. 
And um, this means that we're all at risk to wave-driven flooding. And what is wave-driven flooding? Basically, it's when an offshore wave is coming towards the shoreline. Um, even if it's not during a, a large storm event, that wave can, if it's tall enough or if it's windy enough, that wave can overtop the, um, the dune or whatever barrier is in, is in place and actually inundate or flood the interior area. So as I said, that doesn't have to happen during a storm event, but um, it frequently does. And there are other issues al along with waves, including um, erosion and storm surge and um, lots of other, you know, kind of coastal threats that are even more um, making our, our, our coasts are even more vulnerable today with things like ocean, rising ocean temperatures leading to sea level rise um, and more intense storms. So our coastlines, unfortunately, are very heavily developed and they've never been more vulnerable or more um, valuable. So that's kind of why we do what we do, why we look at um, the coastline along with um, coral restoration. So um, our natural reefs can actually dissipate energy by about 97% on average. And when I say on average, I'm talking about healthy living corals. Um, and that was from a global study done a few years ago. That 97% um, average wave energy dissipation is actually massive, especially when it comes to things like storms, which cause the most damage. Um, and that energy dissipation comes in kind of two, two modes. The first is wave breaking. So as a wave kind of crosses over a reef, it feels the change in depth. Um, if there's a tall, you know, if the, if the coral heads are tall and the reef has been accreting for a long time, um, it's closer to the surface, that wave feels that difference in the depth and then will break and all the energy that was held within that wave um, dissipates. The, other, um, the other mode is through frictional dissipation. So if you have a nice, healthy, complex, structurally complex reef, lots of coral heads, lots of ins and outs, um, that can kind of create friction as the wave um, passes over the reef as well. So you have the wave breaking and you have the frictional dissipation and that is added together to get the total energy dissipation. Um, so we wanted to study this kind of um, from, from a scenario standpoint, right? So we're obviously a restoration lab. We wanted to see if we can restore corals to create the amount of coastal protection that comes along with natural reefs, or at least approach it. Um, so on the left here, you know, we're gonna approach this from a restoration scenario standpoint where we're just restoring corals to the substrate um, and letting them grow and accrete over time. And then on the right-hand side, we have um, another concept where we are actually gonna merge uh, man-made infrastructure, so something like a cement-based breakwater with our restoration techniques by adding corals to the top of that cement-based um, infrastructure. So you may hear me say gray-green hybrid, um, and that means basically we're merge merging gray um, structures like the like the cement reef balls shown in the top right with a green infrastructure approach and green infrastructure just means nature-based solutions in our case it's uh, restoration so um, in order to do this we wanted to kind of study it um, at a fine scale and in order to do that we wanted a really controlled environment so we uh, are lucky to have access to this massive wave tank at University of Miami it's called the sustain wave tank and this facility is run by Dr. Brian House. He's the director. He's also one of the researchers on the U-Link team. And this is a really unique facility because it is actually capable of producing up to a category five hurricane winds. Um, it's also fully programmable, so we can specify the exact type and shape and speed um, and length of the waves that we want to, we want to run. Um, it's also quite large so that we can build models that don't have to be tiny, tiny. They can actually be uh, more easily to scale. So the scales that we used, it's about a one to six real world scale. Um, so basically we're gonna use this wave tank to run different, these different scenarios that I mentioned, the restoration scenario and the hybrid approach. Um, so for the restoration scenario, we wanted to build a model that would be a proxy for a restoration uh, in the real world. And in order to do that, we took actual skeletons, real, real skeletons from some of our restoration work um, and we attached this skeletons. This, these skeletons are from the staghorn coral that um, both Joe and Maddie have been talking about a little bit. Um, and we attached the staghorn skeletons um, to these plastic boards that we could basically arrange in different configurations and place within the, um, within the sustain tank. So I'm going to pull up my little laser pointer. Hopefully you guys can see that. But um, on the bottom diagram, 
basically this is a diagram of, of how we had our experimental setup. We had waves coming from the left hand side, from the wave generator side, um, crossing over our coral thicket model and ending towards um, an artificial beach on the right hand side. And at two points, both before and after that coral reef array, we wanted to measure the wave height so that we could compare the two, look at the difference, and then calculate the energy dissipation between the two. So here's a video of what that looks like. All right, so unfortunately you can't quite see the, um, you can't quite see the, uh, the energy, excuse me, the wave height dissipation in that, in that video itself. It's not really discernible to the naked eye, but you can trust that we had some pretty, um, pretty great instruments that were able to look at the fine scale measurements between the two. Um, and so our results ended up looking like this. So this blue line, uh, think of this as a wave, um, which, it, which it basically is. So on the y axis, you have wave height and on the x-axis you have time. So this is just kind of a time profile of the wave height at the point before the reef. So that was on the left hand side if you remember. And then I'll overlay what the wave looked like after the coral reef. So that blue to that orange, I apologize if anyone is colorblind, um, but basically the difference between the, um, the wave height at the, the oceanward side to the shoreward side is about a 46% decrease in wave height with our coral models, which is a really great result. It's not that 97%, but um, again, if we're able to at least approach um, the, the wave height dissipation or the wave energy dissipation of a natural reef, we're doing pretty well. Um, and so, okay, so that is the restoration scenario. We're also going to talk a little bit about that hybrid approach scenario that I mentioned. Um, and the reason we want to do this is because the restoration scenario does have some limitations, right? It has, we are attaching the corals to the substrate in the real world that, you know, we do that on a day-to-day -day basis, but the time it takes for a coral reef to accrete from um, corals living on the, on the ground takes quite a while. And we've already seen some system-wide flattening of the coral reefs in the region. Um, and in order to bring back the accretion, and accretion basically just means the overall buildup of the reef, to really get that, that change in depth that we need to see the, the wave breaking, we kind of wanted to speed that up by just bringing in the, um, the man-made component. And you'll see these all around um, coastlines where just basically cement-based infrastructure being put out in order to reduce the coastal hazards, whether that's seawalls or breakwaters or what have you. Um, it's kind of a quick and dirty way to mitigate some of the risks on the coastlines. But uh, we really wanted to see if we could make it a hybrid structure so that it's not just a lump of cement being put out into the ocean, but it's actually a living structure that can continue to accrete, um, and continue to grow and become more effective over time, as well as bring back some of the, um, the ecosystem services that I mentioned at the, at the top of this presentation. So what it looked like is basically a trapezoidal structure um, shown up here in the top left, <clears throat> excuse me. And this is again to kind of make that depth induced wave breaking by changing the depth of the ocean floor and then adding in the corals on top, which also includes um, adding in some of that frictional wave energy dissipation by inc increasing the, the structural complexity. I do have another video um, of what this experiment looked like. Um, And I'm, I'm really um, happy that this video kind of ends on this still frame because you can really see in the, in the center here where there's a, a nice break of that wave as it passes over the crest of the breakwater. Whereas in the foreground where there is no breakwater present, there isn't that wave break. So you can really see with the naked eye the difference in how our coral structure is, um, is contributing to that, that wave energy dissipation. Um, and so a little bit of results from this experiment. We did see some wave energy dissipation on the top panel here. Um, this blue line basically is the wave energy that was measured from one end of the tank to the other. And the, um, the wave energy um, basically decreases as soon as it hits the, let me pull up that laser again. 
the wave energy really dips as soon as it hits that very corner of the breakwater or the, uh, the trapezoidal structure. And you can see that the wave energy stays pretty low as it moves um, again across the tank. Now on the bottom, however, um, if you look very closely, I know it's kind of faint, but you can see that this is the structure where we actually added the corals to the top of the structure. And again, you have that dip in wave energy, um, but it's actually an even steeper dip than it was in the structure without the corals. So um, not only are we getting increased, um, increased wave energy dissipation, I should say, decreased wave energy, um, but it's actually also staying a little bit lower than it is um, uh, as, a, as the wave continues to move across the tank. So really great results. Um, but you know, there are always limitations with lab studies. We um, kind of want to know whether or not this is still feasible in the real world. So these lab studies are kind of a precursor to what we hope will be a real world implementation down the road. Um, and we have already had some designs in place where we take you know, a, a structure that's pretty similar to the trapezoidal one that we've tested in the tank. Um, we also have some sea hives that were designed by our engineering team um, and also some kind of basic reef balls or potentially limestone boulders that we want to attach these corals to. So the questions that we hope to answer with the real world study is, is this practical and effective in the real world? Um, will this actually contribute to reduced wave energy if it's put out into you know, a real world scenario where the waves are much less controlled? Um, and also, will the corals survive in an environment like this? It's obviously a high wave energy environment because that's what we're trying to mitigate. Um, and there's also a lot of questions about the implementation. Is it actually feasible or easy to, to you know, put this, to kind of merge these two components um, and have them be effective? We also want to look at the different types of substructures that I just walked, walked through and see whether any of them are more or less effective than the others. And we want to see if we can quantify any other benefits that might come along with it. So something like um, any, of those, any of those ecosystem services that I mentioned, whether or not these structures could atta attract fish, which we expect that they will, just kind of like an artificial reef, but with a purpose. Um, and so we are actually exploring a, um, a real world study with the city of Miami Beach, who have been really, really helpful um, in helping us obtain permits. We're still in the permit phase right now trying to get our permits, but um, please stay tuned and hopefully you'll have some, some uh, real structures that you can maybe go snorkel and, and visit off of Miami Beach. Um, with that, I wanna thank you guys for sticking around and um, I'm really looking forward to answering any questions you guys have. I'll pass it back to Dalton. Wonderful, thank you, Jane and Joe and Maddie. Um, so before we open it up for questions, uh, I first wanted to at least share how to contact us uh, if you have information. So you can see there uh, our social media handle at Rescue Reef. Uh, you can see our website uh, as well as our email address. Uh, but I also wanted to highlight that we are very excited to actually have embarked on a uh, interdisciplinary project to establish like an urban coral reef restoration hub uh, here in Southeast Florida. Uh, and so that project was recently funded and has just kicked off. Uh, and so it actually brings together a lot of these different components, uh, coral reef reproduction, um, uh, coral resilience, um, looking at how we're buffering our coastlines. How do we get the public more involved? Uh, and it brings together multiple universities, government agencies, nonprofits. Um, so again, if you're interested in learning more about that and staying up to date, uh, that's on social media as well. Uh, you can just look up at Restoration Hub. Um, so uh, with that, we will open it up to our Q&A. Uh, so again, please feel free to enter any questions you have into the Q&A box. You can do it anonymously too, if you'd like, uh, and we'll try and answer as, as many as we can here. Okay, so welcome back all of our panelists. Excellent job. I had a lot of fun listening to the, the updates. Um, we have a few, uh, questions in the open box. Um, and so I'll just see if I can pass it off to uh, one of you that seems uh, maybe most fit. Um, so the first one is, have you had any issues transitioning from the nail and cable tie methodology to concrete uh, with citizen scientists? Or do you see the same level of success regardless of who is out planning? Um, Joe, do you think you're able to tackle that one? Yeah, for sure. Uh, to put it, to put it in the uh, 
most blunt way I can, yes, we see the same success with, uh, between, uh, with citizen scientists between cement and nail and cable tie. Um, so far, we've only done a few um, expeditions with cement um, on the, with the citizen scientists um, expeditions. Um, and that is because COVID-19 kind of uh, threw all those out the window since March. Uh, but from the ones that we have outplanted um, and that we have gone back to see, it looks like the uh, level of attachment success in terms of the corals still being there in the first place, as well as the survivorship of these corals is about the same. Okay, uh, the next question is uh, from Dominique. And it says, are there genotypes particularly resistant to sedimentation as well? Uh, Maddie, would you like to, to give that one a go? Sure, yeah, that's a great question. Um, off the top of my head, I actually can't think of a particular paper on staghorn about um, resistance to sedimentation, but uh, we have noticed in our particular work uh, with these genotypes that some are more mucousy than others, and um, mucus is one way that these corals uh, ward off sedimentation. So I would hypothesize that um, that would be the case. Definitely something worth looking into. All right, the next question is from an aspiring marine biologist uh, who is appreciative of the Q&A. Uh, simply asking, is there anything they can do in regards to outreach to further their education and career? Um, I feel like all three of you had a unique path to the Rosensteel School. So maybe each one of you can just talk about, you know, maybe a advice you have on how to get into the field. Yeah, I can start because I kind of touched on it on my slides a little bit. But yeah, when I realized I, I really, really love this work, um, it really just kind of takes using your free time and um, using your own initiative to uh, further your experiences and show the people in the field that you're really passionate about what they're working on, whether that's unsolicited or blogging without being asked to or going on trips and taking photos and sending them to uh, if it's a lab you're working with, uh, just kind of going out of your way to try a bunch of these uh, different uh, paths you can take and then showing that uh, you're really motivated to pursue them. I can also take a stab at answering that. So um, for me, this isn't super related to, um, uh, well, I know that you'd asked as far as outreach goes, how, how that can help you further your career. For me, my the biggest way that I got into marine biology was through scuba diving. Um, I think three or four jobs I was able to get because I was an experienced diver. Um, you know, I, I went through the path of of doing you know professional diving. I was an instructor for a while, um, and I, I just kind of got to know people in the scuba world, which are very well connected to the people in the marine biology world. So um, we are very very excited to hear from an aspiring marine biologist. If you kind of just hang around. Um, you know, the dive community as well as the scientific community wherever you can find it, whether it's at a museum or through a trip like a rescue or reef expedition, or even reaching out to, to people that you find online. Um, that's a really great way to kind of get involved and get your, your foot in the door, I think. I would, I would echo everything that has been said so far. And I would also add something that kind of applies to any job career. Uh, Especially, especially this one I found is just be nice to everybody, especially the people who work uh, end up working under you, um, because they may end up being your boss someday, and that's just kind of the way it is. Yes, uh, the last thing I would add is that um, there are a lot more organizations than you'd think that are doing on the ground in the field uh, conservation work, whether that's marine or, or on land. And so those are some of the best ways to get involved and learn while gaining uh, experience in a scientific setting. Uh, and then networking. You obviously meet the individuals uh, that are working for the organization or that are in the field. So it's a great way to, to learn if it's something that is up your alley and you wanna, you wanna pursue longer. Um, that actually was asked multiple times from people uh, when is the next rescue reef expedition? Uh, unfortunately, we have suspended all of our public rescue reef events and expeditions for the time being, uh, and we'll continue to do so until it is safe to resume. Um, we hope that's in the near future, uh, but because we aren't able to see you all in person right now or offshore, 
Uh, that's why we're really ramping up our online activities. So this Coral Conversations webinar series was uh, developed because we knew that we wanted to connect with everyone and talk about ways that you can still be Coral champions uh, from your homes. And so if you go online uh, to our website or our social media pages, specifically Instagram, you'll see our How to Help campaign that actually outlines soon to be 12 different ways that you can support coral reef conservation and sustainability uh, in simple ways. Uh, so I'd encourage you to check that out. Uh, next question uh, is from John and says, my wife and I saw a lot of wonderful outplanting of staghorn and elkhorn coral by Christ of the Abyss statue. Is that the work of UM? Uh, I can say that it's not the work of UM because uh, we are restricted to Miami-Dade County, uh, but I believe Joe could clarify on if it was another organization. I believe that would be Coral Restoration Foundation. Um, as far as I know, they're the ones doing most of the outplanting in Key Largo, um, which is where the Christ of the Abyss statue is. So I would guess it. Yeah, the exciting thing about Coral Restoration is it's expanded exponentially. So there are multiple organizations in Florida, many more throughout the Caribbean, and now it's essentially a worldwide staple. So a lot of the local areas that you may be snorkeling or diving uh, could have corals that were outplanted by local restoration practitioners. So if you're ever traveling, uh, I'd encourage you to look into if there's any programs in that area uh, who might need some help while you're there. Okay, the next question is, outplanting has been done around the world and there have been storms around the world too. Has there been any cases where storms have hit regions where they have been outplants and did the outplants survive? Uh, Jane, I was gonna say, I believe you did some extensive review of that. So you wanna to touch on that one? Yeah, definitely. So storms these days, because they are increasing in intensity as you know, ocean temperatures rise, are starting to be a huge thing um, that we have to think about when we're, we're performing coral restoration. We don't wanna put out a bunch of corals, you know, at the height of summer and then the hurricane season hits and all the corals that we put out all that work we've done is just wiped out of the wiped out which unfortunately it has we have seen it um, not only here but throughout the caribbean where we really are in storm alley um, and there are some a lot of considerations that we have to think about so basically what we've been doing is cataloging the types of damage that we see with hurricanes um, to restoration programs whether it's in our nurseries. Um, so for nurseries, there are some special considerations like what kind of structures were, um, were in your nursery and how were those affected by the storm. In some cases, we had opposite effects where we had a bunch of sediment that was picked up by the storm and it buried all of our low-lying nursery structures where in other places, all the low-lying nursery structures, the sand was scoured out from beneath them and the structures toppled over. So there's kind of some differential effects that we see in different areas that we're trying to tease out still. Um, and then all the damage to the um, restoration plots that were put out, um, we saw, you know, we, we definitely saw a lot more um, damage to recently outplanted areas um, than we did for, um, for um, uh, outplanted areas that had been there for a few years. So kind of trying to get them out there and, and give them enough time to really cement themselves to so the reef was huge. Um, and also looking at different depths where you're restoring the corals. So deeper reefs seem to be more protected than, um, than shallower restoration sites. Um, so there's a lot of kind of nuances to it. And if you guys are interested in um, knowing more about that, please email me and I'm, I'm happy to talk ad nauseum about it. There's a lot more, I can't really answer it all um, in a few minutes, but yes, there's a lot of different considerations that we, that we look at for sure. Awesome. So there are two more questions in the box. We'll try and address those before wrapping up. Uh, the first question of the two is, are there any considerations to selectively breeding corals, specifically mixing gametes of particular genotypes that have particular traits to get more resilient new genotypes? Uh, I'll open that to anyone who feels familiar with the subject. I was gonna say I could touch on that. Uh, I looked into uh, traits a little bit. Um, we haven't particularly done that here ourselves. I do know that uh, researchers are trying to do that. I think in particular Hoogenboom at, uh, I think at, she's at JCU has some research about that, um, which is really interesting. I know it's really challenging because um, the life cycle of a coral is pretty slow. So when you get that initial uh, cross, it takes a while for that coral to grow up and become mature. And in a lot of the kind of uh, hybridization research, 
Um, there's a lot of concerns about that second generation. I think it's like, if you think back to AP Bio, we have like F1 and F2. And so there are a lot of um, people that are uh, raising flags saying we need to know a bit further. So it's just kind of really challenging and um, takes a lot of time to carry out that research, uh, but it is being done. So I recommend um, looking into it. And our final question of the evening, um, which is very timely, uh, was by Rebecca asking if there is any thought on the recent fish kill that has been occurring in Biscayne Bay. Um, I can speak on it uh, briefly. There are, um, it's obviously really, really sad and a lot of the um, Research has said this is not a normal event. I know there are fish kills in South Florida um, regularly, but not at this scale. Um, and there are a lot of scientists at FIU, at the University of Miami, and um, through different NGOs that are conducting a lot of intense research, uh, kind of figuring out the cause. I know, uh, I think last night, Miami, Miami Waterkeeper released their public statement um, stating exactly um, the different various causes being septic and sewer fertilizer runoff um, and stormwater runoff and um, also warming playing a role making it harder for the water to consume oxygen uh, or making it uh, readily release oxygen but they've also identified a lot of uh, near-term and long-term solutions to um, prevent this from ever happening again so i definitely recommend um, miami waterkeeper has been spearheading a lot of the kind of public outreach and communication about it um, so I would definitely follow them on social if you want to learn a little bit more. Wonderful. Well, I think that is essentially a wrap. So I wanted to take a moment to, again, thank you all for tuning in tonight. Uh, it means a lot to us that you're interested in our efforts uh, and willing to support us in uh, unique ways. We can't wait until we're able to get offshore with you all again, hopefully in the near future. Um, but in the meantime, please make sure to check us out on social media. It's where we give you updates. It's where we give you ideas. And it's where we get ideas from you. Um, we have an email list, too, that you can subscribe to and find at rescuereef.com. Uh, that, again, will make it sure that you're one of the first in the loop uh, for any upcoming opportunities. Uh, and our line is always open. Um, so with that, I will wish you all a farewell uh, and good night. Thank you again.